So the, the focus of today is uh, Hunt's metal and uh, to provide a kind of complementary uh, view with respect to what uh, Luca uh, gave us so far, I'm going to uh, move a bit about not really the characterization of the Hunt's metal. That is uh, very interesting. We could talk about that, uh, I think, for a long time. But I'm going to talk about how the Hunt's driven correlation uh, act uh, and interact with uh, the presence of other low energy collective modes that we can find in metallic correlated system. And I'm going to explore in uh, particular the interaction with superconductivity and nematicity. Our, uh, to be concrete, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, um, a concrete case, uh, the iron based uh, superconducting family. Uh, as um, Luca uh, said, uh, the normal phase uh, of the iron-based superconductive family is characterized by strong electronic correlation. There are a number of experimental probes that can be, in, uh, can be studied. And what is interesting, I think that after these uh, more than a decade of study, we uh, there is a general agreement that the bad metallic phase of uh, iron-based superconductor is well described uh, uh, in terms of Wundt's metal physics. Um, why I decided to study this system in particular, what I'm interested uh, about this is that if you uh, lower the temperature from this normal uh, uh, state, normal phase characterized by bad metallicity, you have the emergence of a plethora of phases. And what catch my attention is that since the very early days, uh, the emergence of these phases and also more or less the characterization of them. So you have a spin density wave, uh, a lower doping, uh, increasing the doping, you have the emergence of a superconducting phase. Uh, as a precursor effect of the magnetic phase, uh, you find uh, a pneumatic uh, order. So this can be explained usually using weak coupling model. Essentially, you have itinerant electron that, yes, can be renormalized, so you can put some effect in mass. But this is a kind of trivial interaction. You have this effective uh, mass uh, that uh, it's uh, renormalizing your electron somehow. And then you can apply essentially weak coupling model in which these electrons are coupled to a boson that can be a spin charge fluctuation and explain uh, the emergence of these phases. Just to be a bit more precise, let me show you what I mean. Uh, so the superconductivity of this uh, system is unconventional in the sense that you cannot explain that using uh, an electron phono mechanism to justify the attraction, the effective attraction between electron. You talk about multiband superconductivity because you have several band crossing the Fermi surface and different gaps opening on the different uh, Fermi surface uh, and different orbital that contribute to the formation of these bands. And essentially, as I was saying, uh, a pretty successful description of the superconducting phase is uh, provided by es essentially a Fermi uh, liquid instability. You have that uh, there is a nesting vector that connects the hole and the electron bands. And uh, the exchange of spin fluctuation between these nested uh, bands essentially can justify the uh, presence of a spin density wave and the emergence of superconductivity because this could provide the uh, mediator to uh, the effective attraction that you need to pa pairing your uh, electrons. What about nematicity? More or less, uh, I can justify the emergence of nematicity using the same approach. Let me just uh, give you a, a bit of information because maybe not everybody is familiar with this. So a pneumatic phase is a phase in which uh, rotational symmetry is broken, but translational symmetry is preserved. Um, it's uh, accompanied by a structural transition uh, from a tetragonal to an orthorhombic environment. So you have a truly uh, uh, X, uh, Y uh, lattice anisotropy that is uh, observable at uh, uh, the structural uh, level. But what is uh, characterizing, uh, namely this uh, pneumaticity is uh, uh, on the electronic properties that uh, uh, presents a huge XY anisotropy. I'm showing here, for example, the uh, elastoresistivity. You see that approaching the pneumatic temperature, you have a differentiation of this. But essentially, all the electron properties uh, show the same behavior, so a huge anisotropy on the XY. I'm reporting here for uh, um, 
um, the sake of the rest of the talk, uh, uh, another uh, two probes that uh, can be used to characterize nematicity. So since uh, due to the orbital spin interplay of this system, when you uh, when you look at the, for example, uh, with neutral scattering, uh, the spin susceptibility, you will find below the nematic temperature and an isotropy of the spin susceptibility along the two perpendicular direction. And uh, this has also repercussion on the ARPES. So if you look uh, at the electronic structure, you have that the XZ and the YZ orbital of the iron in the tetragonal environment are degenerate. If you lower the temperature below the nematic temperature, you see an anisotropy, a differentiation of this orbital. So you see that the nematic phase can be characterized by a number of properties, and we have really a huge uh, amount of information about it. And um, it's, um, it's clear that the electronic, uh, uh, the electronic origin of this phase there is still a debate about uh, uh, if the spin degree of freedom or the charge or maybe can be even system material dependent, but I don't want to enter in this. What I want to say is just that it's uh, as in the case of superconductivity is a phase that can be explained using an inherent uh, model uh, of electron coupled with uh, uh, some low energy boson. So a popular approach that has been used over the year has been say, okay, let me take into account um, the bands uh, renormalization through some uh, factors uh, that are the, um, the Z factor essentially that uh, Luca show us. And then let me play my low energy uh, itinerant electron models. So what I'm gonna show you in this talk is essentially that the story is uh, more complicated because there is a very, uh, huge overlap in the energy scale of the correlation and the low energy degree of freedom mediating the order of phase. And so we have to probably take into account the interplay between these two players. So after this uh, huge introduction, that is essentially actually the main message of the talk. So I hope that is uh, clear. Um, I'm gonna thank Luca for the great introduction about correlation in multi-orbital effect. And I'm gonna show you just a couple of slides to summarize what we learned so far and what I'm gonna use later. So this is a typical multi-orbital interacting Hamiltonian in which I have only local interaction. And you see that you have some density determined, some uh, uh, spin exchange term and so on. A, B are uh, the orbital in this language. I'm gonna just rewrite the Hamiltonian in this way to stress once more, one more time that U minus 3J is of course a special line of correlation as has been also mentioned before because it's the coefficient that uh, control the density density uh, Coulomb repulsion. And uh, instead, uh, uh, this formulation also allow to, to see the effect of J, the Huns exchange coupling, in uh, um, the role of trying to maximize the spin and the log of momentum in the uh, system. So as you can easily see, uh, this is a kind of a balance between these two effects. And if J is pretty large, this uh, becomes the dominant uh, um, effect of the Hamiltonian, so the, the spin uh, uh, channel. So um, I'm going to use uh, this, uh, again, this nice uh, visual that uh, I found in the, the physics today that also Luca mentioned by Antoine George and Gabi Gottlieb appeared recently on physics today to summarize the few concepts that uh, Luca already mentioned. So what we understood so far is that J favors high spin atomic configuration. So if you look at the uh, system in which the correlation are controlled by uh, MOT, by U, let's say, so small J, or if you look at the large J, you have a different kind of multiplets that are populated. In the case of Huns, you have more uh, configuration allowed, but all of them share the same uh, properties of maximizing the, the spin locally. Um, the other thing is that also uh, Luca mentioned is the Janus effect, that J pushed the mod transition away, uh, creating this huge plateau in the Z that uh, essentially is a region of strongly correlated metallic regime in which the Z is finite, but very small. 
Um, and um, the concept that the remote transition is pushed that to higher U, it's easily un to understand uh, if we look at the atomic limit of uh, adding and removing one electron for the for the uh, from the Hamiltonian. It's essentially you see that U minus three J is essentially D scale. Um, and I like very much this picture that I found in the physics today because it's putting this information in the perspective of the bands and the quasi-particle weight. And uh, in the rest of the talk, uh, I'm gonna talk uh, essentially, I would just add a few information about the Hunts medal in terms of how the spectral weight is redistributed. So these uh, um, are a few sketches that I prepared, I think a couple of years ago at this point to try to illustrate in a simple way this concept. Uh, of course, um, forget about the fact that I'm not taking into account the uh, this is a much more precise picture because it's taking into account the, 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 the anisotropy given by the, uh, the doping, but just to understand the energy scale. So if I am uh, in a system in which J is small, you easily understand that you, the scale of U minus 3J essentially reduced to U. So essentially you have that increasing uh, the value of U, you have the kind of usual behavior of the spectral wave that is removed from the quasi-particle peak, uh, and this push away to an energy scale that since J is negligible, is essentially U. Um, and essentially, the, 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 the physics of this system with small J, you would say that is controlled by U and is very similar to the physics of a mot, uh, standard mot insulator transition. Um, what happens if J is large? Essentially, if J is large, you have uh, that uh, U minus 3J, now it's uh, not uh, essentially U, but it's going to be a negligible, uh, always smaller energy scale. And essentially, increasing J, you would see that the uh, spectral weight that was uh, in these uh, Hubbard bands located at U is pushed back uh, much closer to the quasi-particle peak. And essentially, this is... Uh, the final picture that we see here, in which you see that the upper bands are uh, the uh, structure from which the quasi-particle peak uh, emerge. So um, this is uh, very, very, is the crucial information that I'm gonna use for the rest of my talk. And essentially is also giving us uh, a, a guess of what we are gonna find, because uh, what we see is that uh, when correlation are controlled by you, there is a very nice separation from the physics of the quasi-particle peak at low energy and the physics of the Hubbard bands at scale of energy U that is usually of the order of the electron volt. When you have correlation controlled by Hund, instead you see that the incoherent spectra and coherent quasi-particle are not truly decoupled. Everything lives on an energy scale that is much smaller of the order of some electron, uh, milli, milli electron volts that are essentially the same energy scale characterizing the spin fluctuation or charge fluctuation present in the system. So essentially we expect that uh, there's not going to be a non-trivial interplay between correlation and low energy stability. So uh, I will start uh, addressing this topic in the pneumatic state of iron-based superconductor. And uh, I'm gonna show you some theoretical calculation in comparison with experimental results. So before going to the, uh, the, the, the theoretical calculation, I'm gonna provide you just a couple of experimental data that I will use as a benchmark of uh, what I found. So the nematicity in iron-based superconductor can be seen, as I told you at the beginning, by ARPES. Uh, in particular, you can use the orbital resolution, uh, sorry, the different polarization of the light to uh, identify the different orbitals. And you clearly see in the nematic phase that there is a lifting of the degeneracy between the XZ and the YZ orbital of the iron, uh, as I told you uh, at the beginning. So this uh, can be uh, observed essentially in two different kind of uh, energy uh, window. One is uh, close to the Fermi energy. We clearly see a pneumatic band reconstruction with the splitting of these orbitals uh, close to the Fermi level. And another that is a bit more high energy, uh, that is the spectral wave redistribution at, uh, let's say, moving far away from the Fermi level. 
Um, about the, 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 the first effect, uh, this has been studied, uh, I have to be honest, since uh, I would say almost 10 years ago. So we have uh, plenty of experiments. And what is interesting is that essentially, if you look at the kind of splitting that you observe uh, around gamma and the, ga the kind of splitting that you observe instead in the electron bands, uh, you see that there is uh, uh, the uh, same sign of, ch uh, sorry, a uh, change of sign in the uh, or, orbital splitting. So um, this is just a sketch that uh, this, uh, this is provided by the experimentalist. But uh, what I want to stress is that uh, the splitting observer gamma has a sign, the splitting observing the electron bands as the opposite one. So it's a momentum dependent nematic splitting. What we can say about uh, the higher energy spectra is uh, only recently been explored essentially by a single group, but it's very interesting to note that it's uh, not trivial at all. In particular, you have the, the spectral weight uh, differentiation as a modulation in frequency. So you have an, uh, an excess of XZ weight close to the quasi-particle peak, but as you move to higher energy scale, so what you would call Hubbard bands that are very close in energy, of course, as I told you before, you have an opposite sign. So momentum dependent pneumatic splitting close to the Fermi level and uh, selective coherence or frequency modulation of the spectral wave distribution. These are the two key uh, experimental feature. So what we can do? We can try to understand if uh, uh, some co driven correlation are uh, able to explain this experimental feature. What we are going to do is that we are going to study a model in which I have a kinetic multi-energy Hamiltonian, an interacting part that is the one that I showed you before, uh, containing both uh, uh, density density and spin uh, exchange terms, so U and J. And then I will add the pneumatic perturbation that I add as a bare perturbation. And what I can do, I can study the effect of interaction on this uh, Hamiltonian in which I, by hand, break uh, the symmetry of the uh, XZ and YZ orbital. Um, I can do that. Uh, we explore this issue actually in two different uh, phases. Uh, first one was uh, uh, in within the quasi-particle approximation in which we use the slate particle computations. So essentially you can only address the renormalization of the effect in mass and the energy shift. And uh, through a more complete DMFT study that access the full frequency um, uh, renormalization self-energies. So let me start with the first one. So what we did in that case was considering a 5D orbital structure for the ion base uh, that presents a Hund's metal phenomenology for the large phase in the tetragonal phase, so the one in which there is no nematicity. And this is the typical behavior we found for the zeta orbital as a function of u at large j. So you clearly see the orbital differentiation that Luca was mentioning, as well as the uh, plateau uh, behavior. And then we were trying to plug in this Hamiltonian different uh, uh, pneumatic order. I will just show you the result of what I obtain uh, uh, plugging in a ferro orbital uh, uh, pneumatic perturbation. That means that is constant um, and the sign change that is instead modulated with a cosine kx, cosine ky. So let me tell you that uh, before showing you the result, uh, it's uh, not clear what is the I mean, behavior of J with respect to the pneumatic uh, perturbation, because uh, from one side, we heard already that uh, J is happy about orbital differentiation. So something that is breaking the lifting at the general of orbitals uh, could make Huns happy. But from the other side, we also know that uh, Huns want to maximize the spin. And if we create a crystal free splitting between these two uh, before they generate electrons, uh, it's uh, more difficult to try to maximize locally the spin. So just to, to set the, the, the stage of something that is not going to be extremely uh, trivial, I mean, at least uh, we expect. And this is indeed what we found. So this is just a, a truly linear response analysis. So I'm plugging a pneumatic perturbation, computing the density of the orbital XZ, YZ, XZ, and the uh, renormalization factor, computing uh, this uh, uh, ratio, 
and then making the limit for the perturbation going to zero. So this is a truly uh, pneumatic susceptibility in the sense of differentiation of the uh, orbital filling and what I call a Z susceptibility that tell you how the uh, differentiation between the two orbital is uh, behaving. So what we found and comparing the two results by the sign change orbital uh, perturbation and the ferro orbital perturbation is that uh, from one side, they do the same for what concerns the Z. So essentially, if you plug an orbital differentiation between the two YZ and XZ orbital due to the pneumatic perturbation, the Z want to maximize their, they want to enhance their differentiation. So you see that at the Hunt's meta regime, this is U for large J. So this is essentially this color code is telling you that the Z is going down and having uh, the Hunt's uh, phenomenology around this level, you see that exactly at the boundary, you have a peak of this Z susceptibility. Instead, the behavior of the pneumatic susceptibility itself uh, is a bit different in the sense that the ferro orbital order is uh, uh, strongly suppressed, while essentially the uh, sign change order uh, is uh, kind of uh, able to survive. So there is not a peak. Hunts is not pushing the system to make it the transition. But if there is a, a, a factor, like for example, some spin fluctuation anisotropy that is breaking the symmetry, Hund is not suppressing this order. And this uh, linear response analysis is also a, a, a di direct consequence in the pneumatic band reconstruction. So in this calculation, what we were doing, we were plugging a finite uh, their uh, uh, sorry, pneumatic perturbation, compute the new renormalized band and looking at the, uh, the type of pneumatic uh, uh, reconstruction. And what we observe is essentially that, uh, I'll show you the case of the ferro orbital is always the same. Imagine that you put a ferro orbital pneumatic uh, perturbation. So actually you are splitting in the same way the orbital R gamma and the orbital, the electron in the electron bands at M. The main effect of U was to create an homogeneous renormalization of the splitting, of the bare splitting. But the effect of J is always trying to create a momentum modulation. So in my understanding, what is telling us is that um, the, the fact that you have certain region in which the splitting is small is uh, allowing J to make some high spin configuration in that uh, uh, regime. So this is this kind of compromise. And it's interesting because uh, it means that the fact that you observe the orbital splitting is not due to the nature of the uh, trigger, because even a ferro orbital uh, instability will produce the same net effect at the end. So this is actually putting uh, the whole uh, exploration of this issue in a different uh, perspective, that the uh, correlation are shaping the type of uh, realization that is being triggered by another degree of freedom. What about the dynamic field theory analysis? So in this case, we were limiting our study to a three orbital model because uh, uh, the cost of uh, a dynamic field theory analysis. And uh, what we want to do is essentially, now that we understood at the level of Z what happened, we want to really disentangle the effect of the dynamics. So we will study two different uh, set of uh, um, parameters that uh, have uh, a same U, similar U, a different type of J, so low or large, and a similar Z. So whatever we observe is not coming from a different behavior of the quasi-particle peak, but it's coming from the different spectral weight distribution that you see in these two cases is the real example of the sketch I showed you before. So at low J, essentially U minus 3J is a large energy scale comparable to U. And so you have that the Hubbard band structure are kind of separated from the quasi-particle peak, in the case of large J, the structure is more, much more con, 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 compact in this uh, small uh, energy wind of domina uh, control by U minus 3J. And uh, uh, the, 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 the spectral weight is the key difference here. So what we see is that if we plug our pneumatic uh, perturbation in the, uh, in the system and compute again the spectra, 
in the case of correlation controlled by you, we have a kind of expected behavior, which essentially there is a spectral weight of the XZ going from one side and the, X, uh, the, the spectral weight on the Y side go, going from the other. But essentially the structure of the um, spectra is not really changing. So what instead happened if you look at the Hunt's metal uh, regime uh, is that you clearly see that there is not just uh, a shift, uh, but also a remodulation of the orbital redistribution in frequency. And you see that uh, around the Fermi level, you clearly see that there is uh, a much uh, heavier weight of the XZ orbital. And the weight that the set was uh, missing essentially from this side is removed to uh, the, the lower upper band. So essentially you recover the behavior that you expect from experiment with a selective uh, uh, orbital behavior that is modulated in frequency. Um, if we try to understand a bit better from where it's coming, this is a bit a work in progress, but this is a good indication of what is going on. This is just the um, comparison between the self-energy the imaginary part and the real part as a term of uh, the Matsubara frequency for the low J and the large J case. So you see that essentially the imaginary part that is the one from we extract, for example, the Z is more or less behaving the same. And as I told you, this implies that whatever we are seeing is not coming from the quasi-particle peak behavior. But you see that uh, the real part uh, is as a complete different behavior from the low J regime to the large J regime with the um, la, small J regime essentially showing uh, a rigid uh, uh, splitting of the uh, self energies for the two orbital. While in the large regime, you see that there is a crossing and so a shine change at low frequency and high frequency, creating this orbital uh, opposite orbital polarization. So this is uh, uh, the conclusion uh, and uh, about the nematicity. So I, I, discover, I, I show you the nematic feature of the Kunz metal uh, that are the modulation of the orbital differentiation both in momentum and frequency. And I stress, I try to convince you that is the dynamic of the Kunz metal that is needed to coherently describe this experiment in iron base. In the last uh, uh, four minutes, uh, five minutes, uh, I just want to address uh, a bit uh, like, let's say, this is the picture for the nematic uh, order. So a question could be, can be that the dynamic of the Hunt's metal is also important for the superconducting uh, phase? So this is a, a less rigorous analysis. Uh, it's very toy approach, but I'm uh, happy to share this view. Essentially, what we can do, we can imagine to do a kind of BCS analysis in which there is a coupling that is given by God is G and is a, a, a constant in a BCS-like spirit. And uh, you have a bare electron that are first addressed by interaction U and J, and then you want to make Cooper pairs out of this renormalized electron. And you want to see how is the behavior of the gap as a function of U and J that renormalize the electron. And you can do the renormalization again using only the uh, low energy uh, renormalization of the uh, orbitals, uh, the Z orbitals, um, so the essentially the quasi-particle peak renormalization, or you can use a dynamical midfield theory study and plug into the analysis the full self-energy renormalization uh, frequency dependent. And uh, what I'm going to show you is the result for the superconducting gap uh, for the low uh, J and for the large J regime. I'm using here the same approach, focusing on two cases that have similar U, similar Z, different value of the J uh, uh, to, to, to uh, address the issue. And what we see is that if we plug essentially in our uh, BCS calculation, uh, the renormalized uh, Z factor, there is uh, a standard and I would say expected behavior that the gap is suppressed, uh, increasing Q. And essentially the fact that Z stay finite in the large J regime is not helping much because even if there is not mod phase, the gap close pretty rapidly. What happens instead if I plug the full frequency dependence of energy into the BCS calculation? 
You see that with respect to Zara case, in both cases, the gap is larger. So essentially it's making the, 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 the finite energy part is making the gap more robust. But uh, there is also a clear differentiation between the effect of low, low J and large J with a much, much uh, larger boost of the superconducting phase in the Hund's metal physics. This again is traced back to a different behavior of the spectral weight renormalization. Because if we in fact compare the two spectra, we clearly see that the, uh, the, the inclusion, uh, let me show you here from this. Uh, so this calculation I show you, I'm taking uh, an infinite cutoff. So I'm in, in using like uh, the BCS coupling uh, is coupling whatever electron I have. But if I now do the calculation, putting a cutoff of the BCS calculation, that is uh, starting from very low. So here I am computing, uh, putting a cutoff that is very small. It means that I'm pairing only the electrons that are truly on the Fermi surface or uh, in uh, close proximity. I'm enlarging the, the cutoff and I'm pairing much, much uh, a larger portion of the uh, uh, electron in the window energy around the Fermi surface. And here I'm plotting the calculation with the cutoff renormalized to the, uh, the one with the infinite cutoff. So it means that if I go with omega zero to be very large, I expect to find one. What is interesting is that you see that uh, the true uh, advantage of in including uh, more electrons close to the Fermi energy window is actually given by the fact that uh, you are increasing the cutoff up to this energy scale that I'm sorry is not put in here, but is again U minus 3J. So if you start from here and you pair the electrons that are between this window, in the, within this window, actually the gap is getting larger and larger. When you are enlarging the cutoff and you are including also this guy, for example, you see that, that the gap is not changing much. So this is just uh, a calculation, it's a toy calculation that is telling you that the incoherent states uh, participate to the pairing, but not in a democratic way. What is very in this energy window, U minus 3J is participating in the formation of the gap. Whatever is outside is not doing anything, even if it's uh, pretty close to this window. Um, this is just uh, a preliminary study. Of course, we have to understand better, uh, for example, if we plug, uh, a, a, not a BCS like constant coupling, but a true vertex mediated by spin fluctuation, that will have uh, a true dynamics that could have uh, a constructive or uh, uh, productive, uh, let's say, uh, constructive or destructive behavior inter interaction with the Hund's dynamic. And this is just to give you the idea of the type of reasoning that we are uh, using to address the problem. So in conclusion, what I, uh, the take on message on my talk is that what uh, I really think it's an important properties of the Hund's medal is that with respect uh, a correlated metal in which correlation are driven by you, there is not a clear separation of the high energy Abbar bands physics and the quasi particle peak. Everything is uh, con concentrated in a small energy window that is on the same energy scale of uh, the uh, electronic modes that can trigger nematicity, superconductivity, and other instability in quantum system. And so for this reason, the interaction, the interplay of the Hund's physics uh, and uh, uh, this uh, low energy mode is non-trivial and have to be accounted, including in particular the dynamic effect of uh, um, the correlated Hund's metal physics. I'm just uh, concluding putting this uh, visual from, uh, again, the physics today. What I find interesting is that this uh, is, uh, is shown essentially a bit this reason, you know, that at low energy, you have a number of order phase, quantum order phase. And what we are trying to do is trying to understand a bit how this high energy scale and low energy scale uh, talk together. Um, so the conclusion is that the dynamical properties of the Hund's metal shape the realization of these order states. Uh, that uh, you find. Let me uh, conclude uh, thanking the, my collaborators. So the, the work that I show you today is uh, mainly done in collaboration with uh, Elena Bascones, Massimo Capone and uh, Angelo Valli. But of course, uh, I have to thank all the people that I also 
collaborator at CISA that uh, helped me uh, shape my understanding of the problem. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, any question? Okay, so your name first. Uh, hi. Um, hi. Uh, hi, Laura. Uh, nice talk. Um, I have, uh, I mean, I'm quite ignorant about this pneumaticity, so perhaps a stupid question. And furthermore, we might have covered this in the beginning that I didn't. Um, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, right. Uh, so uh, the question is this. Um, so um, the pneumaticity, I mean, is, to, is somehow related to the uh, orbital susceptibility. And this uh, orbital susceptibility is in Hund's metal, not particularly large because uh, this is associated to orbital condor screening scale, and this is not like low in Hund's metals. And then I wonder whether um, when the Hund's metal have, do they have a particularly large tendency to pneumaticity in general, or just in some cases, or how does this work? No, this is a bit of what I was trying to convey here. Let me just reshow the. So this is the truly pneumatic susceptibility in the sense that you are measuring the differentiation of the filling of these two orbital mm -hmm. and uh, see what is the response to a pneumatic trigger. So in this calculation, if Hund is uh, actually happy and wants to push the system towards a, a pneumatic transition, you will expect a peak. So right. what you see is that in no case I found ever a peak, but I think that these plots provide me a useful information. That is, uh, that uh, if Hunz is facing a ferro-orbital constant uh, uh, pneumatic uh, perturbation, you want to suppress it very rapidly. Instead, if the uh, perturbation has a modulation of some kind, Hunz uh, is kind of supporting it, not triggering, not, uh, but just, you know, not suppressing disorder. The susceptibility is kind of plain. And so this had this effect that I was mentioning before that uh, essentially whatever perturbation you put uh, that at this point uh, you have to assume is generated by another degree of freedom. It could be a spin fluctuation, an isotropy, an orbital, uh, the generacy for some, uh, sorry, an orbital differentiation for some reason. So another trigger, but mm -hmm. once the pneumatic perturbation is there, the way that J want to uh, modulate it is uh, creating a sign change between different momentum uh, uh, of the brilliant zone. That is quite peculiar because it's not an effect that you will observe in a system dominated by you that would just try to uh, suppress the uh, splitting homogeneity. I, I see. Thank you very much for this clarification. That was uh, an important point. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Not one. You want to go? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. And I'm, I'm especially grateful that you touched upon the superconductivity at the end of your of your talk. Uh, and I have a couple of questions about this. So, do I understand? So, first of all, you. Uh, just a clarification. So the the superconducting pairing you are discussing is singlet, right? Yes. Okay, because there is another possibility which was in particular emphasized by Philip Werner in this context, which is the wound coupling triggering triplet superconductivity, right? Absolutely. This would be sustained by wound just because it's uh, involving mm -hmm. uh, a line spin configuration. But I was interested in more in understanding the standard singlet S plus minus uh, view yes. in iron-based superconductors. Yes. So if I understand correctly, what you do here is that you postulate that there is some attraction, which is G, that is, we're not going to discuss the origin here. No. And you exactly. study how J modifies it, right? And so the, you make the very interesting observation that uh, if we were just using a quasi-particle low energy description, we would enormously underestimate the enhancement of uh, superconductivity by the 
by the interactions, right? So the at least part of the incoherent spectral weight mm. beyond the quasi-particle approximation is crucial, right? Absolutely. Okay. So from an experimental mm. point of view, is it indeed correct? I think it is correct, but I want to cross-check with you that in many of these iron superconductors, the superconducting transition is actually not from a very coherent metal with well-defined quasi-particles into a superconductors, but indeed from a regime which is still a regime of somewhat bad metallicity directly Absolutely. into a superconductor. So in that context, your observation is very relevant to that, right? Absolutely. And what I was trying to emphasize as a, let's say, starting from this intuition, what I think is important to connect with the experiment is uh, uh, understanding the effect uh, of the, so the, the physical origin of the G. So for example, computing a vertex that is truly mediated by spin fluctuation um, uh, in, uh, in the correct band structure, and also the effect of correlation uh, on the vertex, because uh, we could find out that is uh, not far away from what has been studied in alkali DOP system, in which uh, you can have that uh, correlation effect could actually enhance the tendency of uh, uh, the superconducting uh, pairing vertex. So this is the effect of uh, the correlation on the vertex is uh, a truly open field. Okay, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Sasha Lichtenstein. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a great session. Huns would would be very happy. <laughs> 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 uh, good. So I have two questions. Maybe first, maybe for Laura, but but the second is more general for everybody. Uh, but uh, so since you uh, discussing this very tiny intervening between orbital degrees of freedom, this uh, lattice uh, uh, shifting and, 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 and correlation effects, then uh, an orbital ordering and everything that may be not only Huns, but, but, but other orbitals effects will be important. And uh, uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, iron pnictite is a five orbital uh, system. And in this case, we know that uh, for Coulomb interaction, U, J, and so called delta J is very important. So, people who is involved in spectroscopy know this for 40 years. Yeah. And, and, and they clearly see the effect of J, effect of this uh, delta J, so they know everything locally. And, 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 uh, and uh, parameters is if you think, yeah, U is five, J is one, and delta J is another factor of five is 0 0.2. But, but you see this 0 0.2, if you compare all these orbitals effects is important. And, and moreover, they produce uh, orbital ordering uh, and um, interaction, yeah? Because J cannot produce anything which, uh, how to say, uh, be uh, orbital select, orbital, how it's called, dependent. <laughs> it's just pure, of course, there is, a, no, no, I'm maybe not 100% sure. There is, a, there is this L square effect, but it's only L square. If you put delta J, there, is, there will be more complicated interaction related with so-called all the Raka physics. So how this is important? Because at the end, all this uh, uh, superconducting scale and this delta J probably will be on the same order of magnitude. So this is first question. Well, I agree. Uh, what I try to convey is indeed that it's a complicated problem because we have different player acting on the same energy window. So, of course, I'm not uh, even trying to be realistic in the sense that I'm taking a few ingredients here. What I think it's uh, kind of comforting here is that uh, there is uh, a truly, at least uh, look, looking at iron-based superconductor, 
This analysis in which we take just the basic, very simple local interaction only picture in which you have U and J, plus some information from the uh, non-local physics, like a spin fluctuation mediator, is enough to re reproduce a non-trivial behavior of the, of the pneumatic phase, for example, um, namely the pneumatic splitting that is uh, modulated in uh, uh, momentum and the different redistribution of the orbital spectrum. So I am not at all saying that is the end of the story. And of course, there are other effects that can be important. I'm just saying that this is uh, a really minimum model that allows to interpret real experiments. Okay, okay. Maybe I, I put a second question, which is even related with first, but more general, yeah? Because nowadays we 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 we, we can uh, somehow get a screening effect where you know using the CRPA and maybe even better things. So you could calculate all screening uh, all this U one two three four parameter in a very good uh, accuracy. Who who is thinking about this? Because uh, as Laura said, for 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 this. Uh, uh, potassium 360 is very important and uh, and and Capone of course <laughs> has a great uh, I mean success on this just doing the screening effect plus phonon in in c60 can over screen j and 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 then with negative j you really get a, a strong superconductivity so what is the status now <laughs> DMFT? Yeah, just put screen you and then go ahead. Um, I don't know if uh, Luca want to reply to this question. Uh, what I know is that there has been uh, several studies, I think uh, also by uh, Karsten Hag group, uh, by Alessandro Toschi, that at least are the one that I know about this screening effect. And of course, uh, in my presentation, I am treating the interaction as effective. So I, I, I mean, that's what I'm doing. Um, to 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 understand the the interaction with the low energy modes, but I don't know if uh, Luca has any other comment about it. No, but it's maybe even more general. So people in CCQ, so two two is of course good. I can put big publicity for two V. Well, but 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 CCQ has a uh, all machinery just to put I mean all the right. U matrix screen. So what j just to look at the effect of this. S so since... uh, Sasha, let me make sure I want to understand. So uh, I'm understanding this correctly. So basically, what you would like to see is just at the level of CRPA, let's say the trends of the 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 trends over the screen values of U. No, no, and no, J on, over the no, family no, on, of iron no, no, superconductors or no, what? No, no, you, you, you put CRPA, yeah? And then you calculate at least matrix elements of local U. It will be frequency oh. dependent, yeah? And and also would have all the effect not only J, but delta J as well, yeah? And moreover, it's not even delta J. We have some paper, I forget even what, with my PhD students. It will be not Raka-like. U because screen RPA will already see the lattice effect. You will have even a cubic symmetry, not a spherical. Of course, of course. And then just to see the whole effect, yeah, because. Sorry. Okay, I think we should. Uh, Sorry. I think we should move on uh, to the last question. But I think uh, uh, Bierman wanted to say something. Just just to understand the discussion, because the the CRPA has of course uh, been done with all the matrix elements. But I think Sasha, what you want is something more, right? I want effect. Uh, since we discuss Hume's physics, I want discuss next orbital physics and so. On. Yes. So so I put in the chat uh, a reference. So you have all matrices about uh, CRPA calculations for all kinds of nictites. Um, but I guess now you want uh, to have some mechanism, uh, let it be phonon, spin fluctuations, whatever, further screening, right? That's your question. No, it's enough. I would like to see that maybe somebody said that all these small 
param Coulomb parameter is not important, I can be that only Hunza driving force will. Uh, I see. I think Sasha is preoccupied with deviations from the Kanamori form. That's sure, that's sure, that's, sure. that's that's that is your question. Now I no, no, but this was the... in my hand. Yeah. Uh, then 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 the reference is the good one. Then have a look at the uh, PRB by Ambroise von Rock again. No, 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 oh, but yeah. we, Zilke, we, we, we did this for okay. impurity yeah, model, should. for cobalt, we calculated this. And even, even do some uh, CT hip calculation, which, which is now very accurate, you know. I try to just general question if somebody. You know, no, but the, the, the precise question is you want to know how important are the effects beyond the Kanamori form? Of course, yes. the system. The, the screen interaction does not have spherical symmetry. Yeah. So there will be additional interaction terms. A, uh, and you want to know how important they are. Yeah, yeah, it's even two so levels. That's a very good question. No, no, it's two levels. First level, you just put a static, but all the U, see if if this all small things will, will be effect of zero. This is, a, in fact, a good answer, yeah? Then it's just proof that the the, 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 the Kuhn physics is is a main. But but my my guess it will be main for spin physics, but not main for orbital. And and the second question is uh, screening this frequency dependent. It's uh, two different questions. Well, Sasha, I think that in general what we can answer is that uh, the screening will affect the the U much more than the values of J. So that that we know that we have to reliably estimate u more than j, which is closer to the atomic value. And um, the second point uh, is that the main factor uh, influencing the final outcome is the degeneracy the of the multiplet. So in a, um, an environment in which uh, the orbital space is already broken, uh, I don't think this will change qualitatively the answers, but of course, quantitatively, there might be a slight change. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree, I agree, Luca, but, but reality is very complicated. I said that all the crystal fields, you're talking about some kinds of crystal field splitting. Mm -hmm. All the crystal field splitting are the same order of delta J. This is a nasty problem. Yeah, okay, yeah. I agree. No, it should be taken into account. Uh, but I believe that the standard. I mean, of course, we are. We are. We are, there are two approaches: bottom up and top down. Uh, so in the in the in the fully uh, realistic approaches, uh, some groups are using the full Coulomb uh, vertex with all the symmetries uh, that come out of the realistic calculation. Now it's not only natural that when we try to reverse engineering some effect, we go uh, bottom up and so. It's true that we typically extend the use of the Kanamori uh, uh, interaction or even uh, density density to, to the full shell, which is, this is not correct. But my understanding is then when we are not breaking uh, symmetries that are not broken in the, in the, in the, in the solid, it's still we are not making a big error. Okay. But then we have then in the, in the, in the, in these d models i think the yeah the the big the big difficulty is quantitatively estimating the parameters uh very correctly in the pd models it could be less of a problem but then there you have uh, double counting corrections which are a little bit uh, more problematic i think we have to give a chance to ugo Ah, sorry. Yeah, Ugo has been uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> just gonna pour pour fuel on the fire here. So, so oh, uh, ten years so. ago, I, I tried to use kind of more interaction to model the full five D orbitals, and of course, I got the questions from Sasha. What are you doing? Uh, Slater condom is the full thing, and uh, yeah. So, so some ten years ago, I had a look at this, and it turns out that just using Kanamori for the five band model, you do not have the Atomic limit correctly. So actually, no, no, but nobody is nobody's using Kanamori for five band. We just had we're a talking about three band. The results uh, showing the five band calculations. True. And uh, the, yeah, the oh, yeah, you're right. You're right, you're right. Sorry. Is a 
the Kanamori interaction is a Laporte Pratt degenerate point. So you actually uh, do not even have the ground state atomic multiplet degeneracy correctly. Mm -hmm. So the physics changes actually quite drastically if you just add what uh, Sasha called the delta J, I would call it uh, the Raka parameter that's That's missing. Cool, yeah. But, um, oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm shameless commercial. I have some ten-year-old paper on. Yeah. No, no. It, it's exactly a question for big group like 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 CCQ and for strong uh, postdoc. You know? Because as I said, uh, we we tried to do this ten twenty years ago, but machinery was not there, and and it's not even machinery because. We, you know, after Hunt, we understand Hunt physics, but but importance of Antoine and, and physics today is that they understand somehow Hunt's metal, yeah? And, and now probably we need to go a little bit step, maybe not forward, but but to the left or to the right <laughs> and to see if- But Sasha, that. certainly some of the GMFT calculations by the Rutgers group hmm. on-, on uh... On, whose, on the iron superconductors have been done with the full five orbital interaction tensor. Yes, I know, I know. And, so, and this is why I ask effects. <laughs> As I said, we also did. We also did with full uh, uh, Raka, you, but, but you see, it's one, one did is did a stupid calculation, another understand effect. I said that. 40 years ago, spectroscopy people, because they have experiments, they know very well what is the splitting which related with J. Here we have an experimental splitting which related with F4, yeah? They know it's very well. So that now the question is... Yeah, yeah, well, okay, understanding the problem is that one should always... Uh... Uh, move in a space of parameters, which is not too big. If I understand well, there is not just delta J. In a full shell, you have J1, J2, J3. Uh, so you have more parameters. No. So... For for 5D electron, you have three parameters. It's exactly U, J, and delta J. Yes. If you... If you have spherical interaction, right? Uh, correct. Local, yeah, so that's already an approximation, which yeah, is yeah, 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 spherical approximation, absolutely. So you have more than that. I, so, if you oh. have if you have cubic, then oh, but yeah. So the understanding branches in the several uh, more and more complicated situations. So of course, we we aim to find some general. Mm -hmm. Friends, then yeah, these are no, no, but uh, my people. point is that in well, we should yeah. probably wrap up the session. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, so, exactly. Yes. But I just last point, and then you wrap. In the Hunt's metal, everything is now clear. Yeah, but as soon as you go to system where you have uh, lattice distortion, orbital splitting, yeah, then probably you need to go one step further. That's my point. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Antoine, you want to say a few things? No, I, I think this was a fun session. Uh, lots of activity yeah. there. And uh, uh, yes, I think that was very interesting. And I hope that work on Hoon Metals will, will continue for the years to come. <laughs>